rendering, look dev, woo, all the fun things. So today we're going through Arnold. We're going from start to finish, how I look dev these fish, importing the textures. We're gonna go through everything from render settings. So that's cameras to samples. We're gonna go be going through adjusting your shader. So setting up your color, your spec, your SSS, plugging your normal, your displacement, even transmission, things like that, the more slightly advanced stuff. We're gonna be going through the tips and tricks and the things that Arnold does that makes it quite difficult to use. But realistically, if you have good textures, there's no reason to be scared from it. It's a little bit long, I understand that, but we go through everything. I try not to skip anything out. It does go quickly, but just if there's any questions, then leave them below. Part two is gonna be focusing on lights. I wanted to do this all in one, but there's just no way that I can make a concise video that wasn't three hours long. So in part two, we're gonna be going through lights and actually setting up, once you have your shaders, what to do with that. So yeah, these were the fish that I have already done videos on sculpting and texturing, so check those videos out. So you can also download the model and the ZBrush file for free if you wanna texture and then look dev this and follow along. Um, that's all on Gumroad. It's a pay what you want thing, so if you do wanna donate, then I do really appreciate that. I am a modeler and texture first and foremost, but I have done look dev before. I'm currently doing look dev work for I can't say who it's for. So yeah, um, I hate it. I really hate look dev, but whatever pays the bills at the moment in this economy. Cool, so we're in Maya and first things first, we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna make a shader to apply to these guys. I've already imported my objects and I'm just gonna add a shader. So to do that, I can find the shader I want or I can go into the hypershade sort of window. I don't know what they call this, the node graph sort of thing. Press tab and then I can t look for standard surface and I want AI standard surface. That means it's an Arnold shader. And now to assign that to these, I can click here and right click and then assign material to viewport. And now that will give it the shader. So if we wanna take a look at the options here of this shader, if I click on this and I go to my attribute editor, it will show me everything for it. So if I wanna change the color, for example, or if I wanted to change the amount that the color, the diffuse color affects it, or I can change the specular, we can do all that here. We're not gonna play with any of that because that's what our maps will do. We're gonna plug those in and they will control that. First things first, let's do a test render. Let's get a very basic light in and we can kind of go from there. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna add an HDRI. So if I go to Arnold, if we wanna add a light, you can either go create, and we've got lights here, but if we wanna add Arnold lights, which are separate things, we can go to Arnold here. We've got this lights menu and I'm just gonna pull that out. You can see we've got an area light, a sky dome, a mesh light, photometric, light portal and physical sky. So a sky dome is basically our HDRI. Um, I only ever really use Area Light and Sky Dome. I haven't used these other ones much. Um, if I want to use f like a spotlight or a directional light, which we might end up using later on, then I will go to the Create Lights and they are here. We've got a different section. This is just Maya's kind of inbuilt ones and these are Arnold specific ones. So first of all, let's add a Sky Dome. And I'm gonna close this off and you'll see now our scene has got this giant Sky Dome in it. So what I wanna do is I wanna add an HDRI into this. So where we're gonna put that is in our color section. And you can see we've got all these other options for it for now, but we're just gonna add our color. So to do, to add an image into anything, then we've got this thing here, which is basically just adds a file into whatever slot you're clicking on. So I'm gonna click this and it's gonna ask what I wanna put in. So I could put in any of these like procedurals, we've got fractal noises, we've got all the other ones like a ramp, for example, but I always just use file really. So I'm gonna click that. And now you can see it's changed. Our sky dome is still there, but it's changed color. So what I'm gonna do is that's gonna bring up this menu here and I'm just gonna find the image name. So if I click open, then it's gonna show me, it's gonna open up this option box and I can just find. So I've got this texture library that I've set up, which is just textures I've got from places like texturing.com, texturing XYZ. Um, and in here, I've got an HDRI folder. So I'm gonna open that and I'm gonna find one. So I've got some cool ones. Um, HRI Haven is a great place to get free ones. I've got some flip normal ones that I paid for, but that's more studio lights. Um, and I know the one I want to use because I've previously used it and it and it may look weird because it's for underwater fish, but I found that I tested a lot of these and I found that this one was actually the best, gave me the nicest results. So what I would recommend is when you get to lighten your scene is just playing around and finding what works for you. For now, I'm just gonna open this because this is what I use in the final thing. So I'm gonna turn off this filter type it's by default, it's set to quadratic. This basically just tells it how it handles the image. Um, if it applies any filtering to it, I always just turn that off by default. It's just a force of habit from when I was at uni way back when. So you can now see I've got this HDRI in my scene. Basically an HDRI image is, or an HDR image is one that's got high dynamic range. So where there is light, instead of it just being a value of one, it will be higher than one. And that basically just tells it how much light to output from different points of the image. It's a very simple, way of thinking about it. So let's just do a quick render of that. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna open up my normal render view. 
So I'm gonna open up my render settings. This is by default, we've got set to Arnold Renderer as we should want it. Um, I'm not gonna touch any of this for now. We're just gonna go down here. We're gonna change our render cam. I'm gonna create a new camera. I always do this by default, create camera. And so now I'm gonna go panels, look through selected. And what I can do is I can set up here in Maya, we've got this thing which basically sets the uh, resolution gate. And this shows me the ratio of my current image. So at the moment it's telling me that my render resolution is 960 by 540. Obviously I wanna change that, but I can just line this up roughly something that I want. So I'm gonna change the focal length to something like 50 instead. You'll see how that changes the image. Um, don't worry about this showing through at the moment, we can get rid of that. It won't show through in the render if we set that up correctly. Because this is an individual image, then I can kind of light to the angle, which, which is useful. And then I'm just gonna select this camera again. I'm gonna to go to my option boxes. I'm just gonna lock all these. This is just force of habit again, because now I can't, I'm pressing stuff on my keyboard and I can't move around, which I like to accidentally do. And if you have set up your angle and you're kind of lighting to that, you don't wanna move the camera accidentally, which I'm prone to doing. And now, so you can see this camera here in my scene. And then we're gonna go down here. We've got our presets. So I'm gonna set this to uh, HD 1080, which is 1920 by 1080. So that's full HD resolution, which is fine for this. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go up to open render view here. And I'm gonna make this slightly bigger. I'm gonna go to render, render, and then render cam. So I'm telling it which one to, to show me. And we'll pop back when that's rendered. Cool, so you can see this rendered. It took 19 seconds and the fish are incredibly washed out. And you can also see the HRI in the background. So let's fix that first of all, because I don't want that to show. We've got this RGB option. And if I click on the right, you can see the alpha channel. I'm gonna want an alpha in the background so we can switch between the two of those. So my alpha is pure white. Um, so this HRI is showing in not only the RGB, but the alpha. So what I can do is I can click this now. So I'm gonna go over to the attribute editor for my sky dome and in visibility, I'm gonna turn for the camera, I'm just gonna turn this to zero. And so what this will mean is that in the transmission, the diffuse, all these other options like the specular response, it's still gonna pick those up in the shader, but it's not gonna show my camera. So what I'm gonna do is I can save this image here by clicking keep image. And now this is great for comparing renders. Obviously we're not comparing anything because we just kept that one image, but I'm gonna render this exact frame again and we'll see the difference. Great, so that's finished rendering and you can see that we now have no background. If I click onto my alpha channel, we are seeing that correctly as I'd kind of want it. And this means that in Nuke, I can add a background afterwards. I kind of find that the most useful, just it gives you a lot more flexibility. So we've got our shader here that is applied to the fish. And what I can do is to get this in the node graph, because we're seeing a different one at the moment, we can press this input and output connections. And what that will do is that will show the shader that and anything connected to it. So if we had something connected to our base color or whatever, that would also show those files. So just to make sure that this is the shader that is connected to these fish, we can check that by right clicking and going select objects with material. And now that's selected everything in our viewport with this material. This is really useful if you've got a lot of shaders in your scene or a lot of different objects um, and you haven't named things correctly. So speaking of which, let's name this correctly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna call this fish underscore material. And now here in our hypershade, that's gonna show correctly. So just a quick note, when I make changes on this material, usually you've got a thumbnail here. If I were to change this, we're not seeing that in the thumbnail. So if you if you have got the same thing and you want that to change, you can go over to here, you can go over to system, I believe it is. Yeah, so if you go over to your render settings, we've got this thing here called enable swatch render, and that will basically update this as we go. So now if I were to change this, it changes this. Um, I found the project that I'm working on at the moment, which has got like a lot of SSS and stuff going on and a lot of different shaders that really slows things down as I do it. I'm assuming it's this, it, I'm assuming it's not the geo or the viewport. So I've, I've turned that off myself. And now if I change this, it goes back to that weird little logo because it's not updating anymore. So if you watch the previous video, you'll see that I've already textured this guy. So here in this folder, I've got my Mari exports and I've got them all here in this folder. So I'm just gonna copy this file path. And what I'm gonna do is inside of the node graph here, just gonna bring this along. I'm gonna press tab. And there's two ways you can do this. You can either, for example, if we wanted to add the base color, I can either do it here or I can set the file down myself. So probably when you're starting up, you're gonna do it from within the shader itself. So I'm just gonna to go to color and it's gonna ask me what I wanna add into that. So just like before, I wanna add a file. So now let's drop this file down, which is plugged into our base color. So at the moment we've got nothing here. I'm gonna just, again, force of habit, I'm gonna turn filter types off. And then all I need to do is I need to load in this image name. So I want my base color. So you can see here, I've got my UDIMs. This is a four UDIMed asset. Um, so I'm just gonna open one for now. That's gonna open that. 
So you can see this isn't loading because I don't have the swatch thing on. So it's really important when importing files to use in your shaders that you tell it that you are using UDIMPs because at the moment it's just loading in this 1001 and we want it to pick up from 1001 to 1004. So the way to do that is underneath here, we've got this UV tiling mode and under that we've got this one UDIM which tells me that it's coming in from Mari. So if I click that, then we can do a preview quality which will generate a preview. I'm not gonna do that. Um, and it, now it's changed it from 1001 to this code which just picks up the UDIMs. So perfect, that should be working. Now color space, because I'm picking up EXRs from Mari, then color space raw is fine. If you're finding that you have color space issues in your scene, if your textures look like they're gammaed up or gammaed down, then check out your color space and make sure that this is correct. Color space is a whole other topic. I'm hoping that it's the video I do after this. It might not be, I've still got a lot of writing to do that. And and need to make sure that everything's correct, but keep an eye out for that. But yeah, it's just something to be aware of. So now that's connected, we've got one image in here and you can see now that the color has gone black. So what we're gonna do is just to show that that's working, I'm gonna open up my render view again and I'm gonna hit render. I'm gonna keep this render here. If I click keep image, then you can see now that we've got those there. If I wanted to delete this first one, then I can press remove image now. And now we've just got this white one and I'm gonna render that and we'll see, we'll just make sure that that image is coming in correctly. Great, so it's finished rendering, and would you look at that, it's, um, it's worked. So if we compare that to the first one, you can also see, because this was pure white, it was blowing out, it was overexposed. Whereas this one, because we don't have as many high values, it's not doing that. And that's why it's important to kind of get your textures on before you start lighting, I would recommend. So we've got this file that it made for our base color when we imported that. So I'm just gonna change this to cull. You don't, I would recommend doing this, but you don't necessarily have to, it's just, force of habit keeps it clean. So this is basically just our image. And then here we've got this place 2D texture. So this is basically just telling it how to map correctly onto our objects. So you can see it's giving the UVs for this image file correctly. If this were a tile texture instead of one painted to the UVs for our object, what you can do here is say, for example, you wanted a tile more, then you can repeat the UVs here. And now this will go four times across the U and the V. And if I just quickly render this, you'll see what I mean. So as you can see, it's applied that texture four times along the U and four times along the V, and obviously it looks very incorrect. But that's just, if you're using a tile texture to break up your spec or to do anything like that, then that's where you can get it to change the repeat method. So if we take a look in my exports folder, we can see we've got a base color. We've also got a bump. We've got a metallic, a normal. We've got an opacity, a roughness, blah, blah. So we've got all this stuff. So what I can do is I could go along, for example, my spec roughness, and I can click here. And I'm going to add a file and now I'm going to find that and I'll just go roughness, make sure this is set to UDIM and now that's all set up correctly. So if we go back here, now you can see that this roughness is being controlled by an image here, which is this one. So I'm just going to change this to spec R and now I know that this is spec R. So now that I've added this spec roughness, one thing that we need to be very aware of when creating our materials, especially if you're doing it like this method and it's it's hooking it up for you, is that you make sure that you're connecting the correct thing into your shader. So if we have a look here on our base color, we're taking out the color and it's going into this base color. But on our roughness, for some reason, it's coming of the out alpha into our spec color roughness. So what happens if we try and connect up the color? Let's try and do that. Well, for some reason, it's grayed out. Why is it doing that? Well, basically, you can see here we've got a green dot and we've got a red dot here for our specular roughness. So if I were to change color, it won't go into spec roughness, but it will go into spec color. So what's up with that? What this green dot is telling me is that it's a single channeled object. Our roughness is black or it's white or it's gray in between, whereas our specular color can be red, green, blue. It's a multi-channeled input. And it's the same with our base color here. So we're doing RGB image out into an RGB image. So if I wanna connect our color into our spec roughness, so if I open up this out color now, you can see we've got our red, our green, and our blue channel. Now they're all single channels, which is what our specular roughness wants. And all of these are the same. So if I plug that in, I can use any because they're all exactly the same. Then now that goes into our spec roughness. And it's really important to watch out that you don't use the out alpha. I don't know if this is the case anymore, but at least in the older versions of Arnold, um, if you had nothing in the alpha, then it would muck up your shader. And I think that's still the case. So make sure when you're adding a single channel map, so that's something like roughness, opacity, if you're using an SSS weight map or just a specular weight, anything like that, make sure that you're not using the alpha option and you're using a single channel from your out color. So you can use any of them, just make sure you're doing that. So I accidentally spilled water all over my desk when I was recording this bit earlier, um, but we plugged the spec roughness in now and this is the render 
after and this is before so just taking a look at that and you can see the difference that makes the spec is a lot tighter overall um, and we're actually getting some kind of detail whereas we kind of went before if this was too much then i could change the color of the spec if i wanted it to be less i could turn that down or i could turn down the weight either or but yeah that's the spec roughness working so now that that kind of looks as i would expect it to i can head on to the other maps so next up let's set up the normal map so i'm just going to copy and paste this Control c Control v the reason I'm doing that is because it gets the UV tiny mode and it keeps the filter on, um, makes sure the color space is raw, and then I'm just going to go here and I'm going to load in my normal map. So normal maps are a little bit different in the respect that, um, so I've got this thing down here called normal camera, which is what you would plug it into, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a node in between. So I'm going to press tab and I'm going to go to AI normal. And basically what this does is if we have a look at this node, we've got this option called strength and we can also invert the different X, Y, and Z of the texture that's coming in. And the reason this is great is because I can just plug this here to the input. And if I want my normal stronger or weaker, then I can just change this here without having to go back into my texturing program. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag this value out from normal camera. So if we have a look at that, I'm just going to open up the render view and then let's just see what that does to our image. So overall, that's looking good. We've got that in. You can see that we've got some detail from the ZBrush sculpt. You can see the previous video on that if you want to know more about that. We've got a little bit of weirdness here and here around the mouth and the eye. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's some weirdness either from Mari or maybe the ZBrush export um, that I would need to for a final thing. I would need to go in and clear up, but overall it's looking okay. This is why it's useful to add one texture map at a time because then you can work out, if you have this line, you can kind of work out what the issue is and which map it's coming from. So now I can go back into my texturing software and fix that. But for speed, and because this is this tutorial is taking so much longer than I thought it would do to record, we're just gonna move on to the next one. The beauty of this is, so I can just now, I'm gonna keep this image and I'm gonna turn the strength up to two. You'll see why this AI normal map node is useful. So yeah, now the strength on this tail has doubled but also so is the weirdness around this eye. So I know for sure that I'm getting some strangeness from my normal map. So that would just need to be fixed inside of my texturing software. I could change it to 0.1 as well, which would make it a 10th of the original strength, but I'm just gonna set it to one for now. Cool, so now we've got that in, let's do the next map. So I'm gonna paste again, make sure this has got the UV tiling mode, the UDIMs, and we've got the filter off. So which one is next? Let's take a look at metallic. So our metallic map, I'm gonna drag and drop this into metalness here. Again, because it's a little green switch, I know that it won't take the out color. So I just need to take one of the R, the G or the B and let's render that. Let's see how that looks. So this map, if you remember from the previous video was set up to make the scales and stuff really pop out. Obviously because it hasn't been lit properly at the moment, then we're not really gonna get any glints from that HRI. We're gonna need things like area lights and stuff. So for now, I'm just gonna make sure that it seems to be doing what I want it to be doing. So you can see the difference that's made, especially on the eye and on these scales, that is picking up correctly. Quick side note, if you don't know what metallic map or any other texture maps are supposed to do, you can check out this previous video I did, which explains all of that for you. Cool. This line is starting to annoy me. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start turning down the normal map strength. I'm gonna change it to 0.3 and that will soften this. Because this is a look dev video, I'm not gonna go back in and retexturing it. If I was at work, then obviously I would need to fix that. But I'm lazy and this is just for YouTube. Cool, so if that metallic was looking a little bit strong, and I know for a fact in the final thing it does, um, then what I can do is I could, we're gonna add our first kind of look dev tweak, which means that we don't have to go back into texturing to make changes that we want to. Also, I do apologize for this. I marked it up when posing it in ZBrush. So that's not an issue with the shader or the look dev or anything. It just, it's a comment on my ability to quality check stuff before I do start doing final renders. But ignoring that, um, so I've changed that normal map strength down. Uh, but this metallic, I think is slightly too much. So there's a couple of ways to go about finding a node that you wanna use to change. So I've closed off my create node here, but we can go just to window create and that's gonna bring that back out. And this is just a way to show you all the nodes that you can use. Uh, so under utility is usually where you'll find things for color correction. So we've got under Maya, we've got color correct, but also under Arnold, we've got our own utilities. So we've got, um, there's like an AI color correct, I'm pretty sure, AI color correct here. And we've got all these different ones. In this specific example, because I know my metallic map goes from black to white, white being the most metallic, I wanna bring down that white level so that it's not quite as metallic everywhere. So what I can do, there's a node called AI range. It's kind of like, sort of like a clamp and I can change, if we have a look here, we've got our input min and our input max. So we're getting 
black to white coming in, but then we're getting black to white coming out. And what I can do is I can change this max instead of it being white, I can clamp that down a little bit to something like 0.7. And if I now plug my color into the input of this node and then the out color of this node into the metalness, I need to remember to use the red on that because it's a single channel. You can kind of see here what it's doing. It's giving me a thumbnail. So if I change that back to one, you can see it lines up. If I change that back to 0.7, you can see it brings down all the whites. So here you can see we've got a before and our after. And you can just see the effect it's had on the metallic here. These, so the metallic map is for the scales. You can just see the way overall it's kind of changed that area, it's just brought down the level of metallic. Full disclaimer, probably shouldn't be doing that. As I explained in my previous video, metallic maps are a whole other thing. Um, this was purely because it was a one day texturing job and it was kind of just to cheat it quickly. This is more to demonstrate the power of nodes inside of your shader. So if you've got textures that are pretty much there and you don't wanna go back to your texturing software, then you can just do final tweaks inside of here. And also if I knew that that value is working now, if I knew that my white should be down to 0 0.7, then what I can do is I can take that value back into Mari and bake that into the textures so that no matter which render I'm using or who I hand these textures to, then they're always gonna work and you don't need to use this node. So this can actually be really helpful to kind of re-inform your textures. So often I would do that so I could take this and bake that into my textures rather than having it in the look dev. But for this tutorial's sake, we're gonna keep that in there. Cool, so we're starting to really build up this shader. So let's get our next thing in. Let's have a look what else we've got to go. What we're gonna do next, we're gonna do bump. So bump is, in this instance, we're gonna use this for actual displacement because inside of an Arnold shader, we've already got this normal camera here. And if we, so if we wanted to apply our normal map, the way to do that from inside the shader is that you go down to geometry and we've got this bump mapping section, which is where you either put a bump or a normal map. You can't put both. So we're gonna use our bump map to actually displace the scales and stuff like that and bring them out. So if we have a look at our shader here, there actually isn't really a section called displacement or anything. So how do we get it in? Well, if we have a look past our shader, we've got this thing called the shading group. And the shading group, if you're in your attribute editor to access it from here, you press this button here, which is the connection, the output connection, then that will show you here. And we've got this thing called a volume material and also a displacement material. So displacement material is where we're gonna place our displacement. So you would think that what you do is you just drag because displacement is black and white, you black, drag one of these to our displacement shader. Um, that isn't how it works. So I'm gonna undo that, that wouldn't work correctly. So to get it to set up correctly without having to do it manually, I usually just go here and I'm gonna click here and I'm just gonna click file and it's gonna give me the correct node that I need. So I'm gonna move my bump down and you can see that in between this file that node that it's created, it's added this displacement shader. So this displacement shader node is very similar to our normal map mode that it made that we made when we were setting up our normal map um, in the fact that it changes the scale, you can change the scale and you plug in your displacement. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug in my displacement here. I'm just gonna take the R from our bump and plug that in and now I can get rid of this file node because I don't need that anymore. Um, but there is one other very important option. So if we go to Arnold here, and this is Arnold specific. So if you're using V-Ray or Redshift or whatever, don't know how that works inside of Maya because I haven't used those, but we've got this thing called scalar zero value. Without getting too complicated, basically what this is telling Arnold or your shader is what value in the map is no displacement. So at the moment, black zero is no displacement, but our map that we've textured inside of Mari, mid gray or 0 0.5 is no displacement and then white, is pushing out and then black is pushing in. So some software like ZBrush and I think Substance's height might by default use black as no displacement, then higher than that it pushes out and lower than black, so negative values push in. But because we were painting with 0 0.5 gray as our no displacement because it's a lot easier to hand paint with, then we need to change this. So we need to tell it what our no displacement value is, which is 0 0.5. Um, so if you're adding a displacement map to your shader and you find that your object is pushing out way too much or pushing in way too much, then chances are it's this scalar zero value they've missed off. And it's very easy to forget or miss. Um, so I recommend checking that out every time, making sure you know. Um, so at the moment, this is gonna set to a displacement scale of, of one, which is very high. Um, and we're gonna see that now. We'll see how that looks. I'm just gonna save this image and let's see what that does. So I'm probably never gonna sleep again well because of how terrifying this looks. So obviously our scale is way too high. So by default, usually I just use 0.1. Um, my scene is centimeter scale and I find that that in general kind of works, but you can go in and tweak this. So let's just quickly save this image and re-render that, see how it looks. So while that's looking a lot better, I'm getting some slight intersection because the fins are so thin. 
they're kind of intersecting with each other in places like this. It's just kind of coming through and it overall just looks too lumpy. So I'm actually just gonna half this. So I'm gonna go 0 0.5. So there we have it. It's looking a lot better. I still think it's potentially a bit strong, but because we're also using a normal map, then maybe we can just turn that down a bit. So I'm gonna turn that down to 0 0.2 and maybe I'll change this displacement value. Actually, you know what? Because we're gonna be using SSS, which can often remove a lot of the detail, uh, I'm just gonna keep this like this for now and we'll just move on to the next bit of our shader. So editing my gear, and a quick thing that I didn't touch on about displacements that I should have done is if you find the displacement isn't getting quite enough detail or it doesn't feel crisp enough, then chances are the mesh doesn't have enough subdivisions. So in Arnold, if you press three on an object and it's smoothed, then at render time, it will subdivide. However, if you've got really tiny detail in your displacement, then is based on the resolution of the mesh to how much you'll actually displace. So your displacement has this option, if we go to Arnold, it's got this thing called auto bump. And what Arnold basically does is it fills in any detail that it can't get with the displacement with a fake bump map effect. So if your displacement looks kind of flat, then maybe that's this auto bump. You can try turning this off and on, and that will tell you if that's the thing that's doing it. So what you can do to get more subdivisions into your mesh is if we come down to the Arnold settings of your attribute editor of your individual object, you can go to this option called subdivision. So you can change it to Cat Clark, and then this iterations will tell it how many times you want it to subdivide. So basically raise this as little as you can and just test render on one, see if your displacement looks nice. If it doesn't, then raise it to two, do it again, do it again. I wouldn't recommend making the iterations too high because obviously it's gonna make your render take longer, but that is the way that if your displacement isn't giving you the detail that you expect, then chances are it's because of the subdivision and there isn't quite enough resolution. Cool, onwards. Now let's paste in, I'm just gonna paste another roughness and we're gonna find something else to add in. So we're kind of on the home stretch now, actually. Um, we've got our opacity map and we've got our SSS weight. So opacity, I think, is gonna be the easiest one to get set up. So while I've called this map opacity, let's have a look at Goldfish so you can see what I'm trying to get out of it. So if we take a look at this reference image, you can kind of see the way that Goldfish tails work. They get a lot more transparent towards the end, and we've got this kind of translucency, but you're still sort of seeing the edge of the tail. It's not like it's completely cut away or transparent. We're getting some kind of like refraction, some like the light is playing through it. It's not completely as if there is nothing there. So inside of our shader, we've actually got two options. We've got this option here called opacity, which you might think is the one that we want, but we're actually gonna use this thing called transmission. What's transmission, I hear you ask? Well, let's get up the definition. So here's a really handy little website called Arnold's Documents. So Arnold has a really handy website for its documentation. And when I'm look deving, I will often open this up because I don't remember what everything does every single time, especially when it gets to things like SSS, trying to remember the radius and stuff like that. Obviously spec roughness and stuff when you've done it enough, you it's like, I know it like the back of my hand, but some of these things, not quite as easily. So transmission is basically, it allows light to scatter through the surface for materials such as glass or water. So if we take a look at that goldfish tail, that's kind of what we want it for. It's almost as if it's kind of glassy or like watery. So we're gonna actually apply this opacity map to our transmission rather than our opacity setting. So opacity is more for like, so as Arnold's own website kind of states, usage for opacity is making for kind of like sprites. Like if you're doing like poly hair or something like that, or here they're using a leaf, you can kind of see the difference between that. So for this particular effect, because we want refractive materials, because the light is going through that tail still, then we are gonna use transmission. Cool. So I've got my transmission map here or my opacity map as I've called it. And what we're gonna do is we've got this transmission slot here, which is the value. And so because it's a green dot that tells me that it's just a single black and white map, so I'm gonna drag and drop my R into it. And now if we go to transmission for the shader, you can see now we've got that plugged in. So transmission is a funny one. It's gonna use this index of refraction here to tell it how much to refract that surface. So I think the easiest thing to do is what we're gonna do is we're just gonna save this render and then we're gonna re-render and we're gonna see just plugging the map in what that does. And then after that, we're gonna to have to actually look dev and start adjusting some of the other sliders that we're not plugging maps into to get an effect that we want. This render took a lot longer and you can kind of see that something has definitely happened, but not what we wanted. So first of all, the reason these scales aren't translucent is because where it is metallic, transmission is ignored. Uh, I don't know the science or the shader reasoning behind that, but that's worth mentioning and knowing. Um, and you can see on our tail, I wanted the reverse effect of this. So if we have a look at the map, 
I've actually got black on the tail where I need white because white informs the Arnold shader where it's going to get the transmission effect. Now at the moment this map is telling it that on the body I need transmission, on the tail I need none. And looking again at the render we can see that it's done exactly the opposite of what I want. The tail, no transmission, and the body is where all the transmission is situated. So I actually need to invert this map first of all, so let's do that first and foremost, and then there's a few other things that we need to look at. So the way to do that is if I press tab, so you'd think it's called invert, there is this inverse matrix, but that's not we, what we want. We're actually gonna use, it's called a reverse node. And that's basically, it's just gonna inverse whatever we put in. So for this, it needs three channels. And then I'm just gonna take the any of these. So this is actually our RGB, even though it's calling it XYZ. I'm just gonna plug that in here. And then what I'm also gonna do, because you can see this render time, it went up to two minutes. I'm also just gonna change my uh, we've got sampling camera AAA is set to three. I'm just going to turn this down to one. And basically camera AAA is a multiplier of all these other ones. So you can see that um, it's lowering the samples of everything, which is just going to speed this up. Cool. So would you look at that? That's done exactly what I wanted it to do. So around the tips of the tail where I painted on this map, then we have got that effect. Cool. So there's a couple of things I wanna look at now because this doesn't really look that transparent. You do have to remember that because we've got an HRI then it's gonna be refracting this image through so that's why it's partly gray. If you didn't want that, then you can change on this visibility that we change the camera down. You could also change that in the transmission so it doesn't appear there. But these objects, no matter what we do with this transmission, aren't gonna be see-through and there's a particular reason for that. So if you want an object to be see-through in Arnold, by default, they're opaque. So to change that, you just click an object and you go down to this Arnold thing and we've got this option here called opaque and I'm gonna unclick that and on this one, I'm gonna unclick that here as well. So now we'll see the difference that that makes. So rather annoyingly, there is no change um, when changing it from opaque to not. That should absolutely not be the case. I've had it way too many times where I'm trying to shade glass or something in Arnold and it just doesn't work. And I'm like, why is this not working? I'm banging my head against the thing. Um, and it's because it's because this uh, this tiny little button under this Arnold object called opaque is not showing. Um, I don't know if that's because I imported these objects from a separate scene that I'd already set it up in. I don't know. That should absolutely not be the case. Maybe Arnold's changed recently but I know that that can be a real nightmare. So if you're doing glass, make sure that this is turned off from opaque. So if we have a look at these tails now, one thing that if we look at them, they're not really like see-through. There's a lot of kind of refraction going on in there. There's too much refraction, I would say. So if we go back to our fish material here, under our transmission, we've got all these kind of things that we can change. But one thing that we want to change on this is the index of refraction. So if I click this, it gives us presets for different objects. So stuff like skin, for example, is apparently 1.4. Uh, water is 1.3. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a screenshot of this now. And let's have a look at if I really lower this down to one something like 1.1. Basically, this is going to refract the light a lot less. So it should appear more see through. And what I've done this time, instead of rendering the whole thing, I've dragged a by just clicking and dragging, I've dragged a little selection box. And I've pressed this render region button. And you can see the difference that that makes in the refraction. So the refraction actually goes all the way down the tail here. So it's looking really bright at the moment, but if we turn this, I'm actually gonna turn the background on just for this instance and you can kind of see. So with the background on, you can see how it's actually, you're seeing through a lot more. So if I really wanted this to not kind of have this edge, what I can do is I can go to this fish material and if I change this to something like 0 0.01, then we would really start to lose any form of refraction in here and it would start to look see-through. That, yeah, we're starting to see it looks a lot more jelly-like rather than some sort of like piece of glass. So I spent a lot of time playing around with this in the final render for this and I actually stumbled across, I like the IOR of 1.02 there. So let's just have a look at that. Cool, so we're starting to see, you can see like a shadow of it ever so slightly behind, um, but you're not really seeing that edge or anything like that. Also that edge could be too thick, which is why why we are seeing that. That could be the model rather than that. But yeah, overall, I think that gives me a pretty good effect. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna turn the visibility of this off and render the thing again. Cool, so yeah. Obviously, without that image there, this could look quite incorrect. Um, so you might not necessarily want to turn your HDRI off, but the image from that HDR is going to be refracting through this transmission. So if you didn't like that I'm getting some green here, especially if these fish are spaced underwater, then maybe you don't want to use that image. 
Hi, Editor Mike again. So I need to caveat what I've just told you about with the IOR, because I think this is important. While I know this is a beginner's video, I don't want to get too in depth with creating shaders. I want to just show the basics, um, but I think this is important to say. So IOR, while it changes the transmission refraction, it, it also changes the way the normal specular response affects the rest of the mesh. So without going into too much information about Fresnels and stuff like that, basically when you change the IOR from 1.5, which is the default, to something lower, you can see how this affects it. We're getting a lot less reflection on the front of the mesh. And I should have caveated that on the fish, that is also the result that I got. So there are ways to set this up. I could set up a shading network that made it so the IOR was only different on the tail. And um, you can read through, this is the Arnold documentation for Specular, which has got some good breakdown on what IOR is and how it works with transmission and that lot. One tip I would recommend when you're working with IOR in a shader, if you go to Google and type in IOR, for example, you're shading some milk. IOR of milk, then we've got this great little website called Pix on Poly, which has the index refraction for basically everything under the sun that you can think of. It's not going to have fish's tails, but it's going to have, so for example, you're doing plastic or you're doing a pearl or you're doing Teflon, then all these kind of materials, it can tell you that. So that's a great way to get it. Sorry if this is going over your head, feel free to ignore this, but I think it's important to mention that um, I didn't necessarily do this in the most technically accurate way. And I would probably have to make a slightly more advanced shader to make it so that different parts of the mesh had a different, had a specular response that behaved as I would expect it. That's just worth noting. Also, if this is starting to look black, I'm gonna start talking about render settings a bit more. Um, if we go over to our Arnold renderer right here, on top, we've already looked at samples, but we've got this ray depth option. Ray depth is basically how many times the light rays are gonna bounce around in your scene. So we've got it for diffuse, we've got it for specular, and we've got it for transmission. So at the moment we're on transmission. So I've turned this up quite high to nine. It doesn't necessarily need to be that high, but if I turn this back down to zero, then we should see that basically when the light goes into the object, it's not gonna bounce at all. So we're not gonna get anything lighting up. We're not gonna get any refraction. So this will probably just be black. So if your refraction or your transmission values are coming out black, then that's probably because your ray depth is not high enough. Or it could also be your transparency depth, which is another option. Yeah, so we're not getting any light refracting through there. And the same for this transparency depth. If you don't have this high enough, then it's not gonna bounce light around. So this is gonna raise the render time of your image because more bounces means more calculations. So what you can do is you can raise this to an, a value that you like the look of and then start lowering it and seeing when it breaks. And then you can kind of put it at that value. For now, I'm just gonna keep it at, gonna put it up kind of high again. And the same with diffuse, this just means that the light from the diffuse will bounce around a little bit more. So you get more light bleed and stuff like that. So I should probably raise these up a bit as well. So the final thing we're gonna look at for setting up the shader is SSS. And I've kind of left this to the last because I hate SSS. Uh, I find it really fiddly. I'm not a look dev, as I probably should have prefaced this video with, I hope I have, um, although I am doing look dev work at the moment. Um, and I find SSS to be really fiddly. So this is one, along with the transmission that you can sit there and kind of tweak values for, for quite a long time. Um, so we haven't touched the transmission. We haven't touched all these other things because for this specific render, I didn't need depth. I didn't need it to look more colorful as it went through the object. These are all things that you can find out about. If you type in Arnold transmission and you go to this document page, then there's a really good breakdown for every single value inside of here. So if you are having issues with it, um, then you can just go along here and see what all these different values do for things like the depth or the scatter and isotropy and all that jazz. It's all in there. For subsurface, we've got a breakdown of every single value, how changing the radius will affect your render. So let's set up the SSS for this. And then maybe this, I might have to break this tutorial up into two parts. So we're gonna paste in our final map now. I'm gonna call this SSS weight, which is what it is and let's load up SSS weight. So I'm gonna drop this in. We've got this here, if we go down to subsurface, because these fish are quite guppy and like waxy and kind of like jelly-like things and I want to get some light scatter through because they're so fleshy, then that's why I've created an SSS map. So I'm gonna drag and drop this here. Again, I'm dragging off the color, so I actually need to just drag off one of the channels because it's a black and white map. So. What is subsurface scattering? Subsurface scattering is basically when light comes through an object, some of that light gets absorbed by the surface and can kind of bounce around inside of it. So the most prominent example you can think of, for example, if you were to put a really bright light behind your ear, so this is subsurface scattering. We've got light coming from behind the object, bouncing around inside the object, and then coming through the front surface, and we're seeing that as a red glow. It can make things look kind of waxy because they're absorbing light. So here, 
Um, we've got a lot more SSS than here, and this looks really plasticky, and this looks really waxy. Um, so it's really good with skin, with organic objects. So this is a mask. Basically, I'm telling it that I want it to be uh, on the body mainly, fading off on the tips, and none here. The reason I don't want that is because I don't want the tips to be blown out because they're kind of transparent. They shouldn't really be subsurface. A lot of that shader detailing is going to be coming from the transmission rather than the subsurface. Let's let's get to work. So let's have a look now if I just render. So you can see what the SSS has done here is it's adding the light is kind of bouncing around inside the object and it's giving me a white color. So where's this white color coming from? Well, subsurface color here. And we've got this thing called radius and we've got this thing called scale and type. We're probably not going to touch type in this, but this just changes the way the algorithm that it uses to work out SSS. For this, random walk is fine. Um, so I want to change this color first of all. So what color do I want coming through? So if you were to imagine, if you think about when you shine light through an ear, it goes a lot redder because it's picking up kind of the blood vessels and stuff inside it. So we really, we just kind of want the same sort of color that this fish has, but maybe a little bit more saturated. So how are we going to do that? Let's take our base color. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pump up the saturation on this and then plug that into the subsurface so that when the light shines through it, we get the same color that we had, just a little bit brighter. So I'm going to do an AI color correct. I'm going to drop one of those down. So that was just by pressing tab again. And I knew that there's a there's a Maya color correct, but I much prefer this Arnold one. So I'm just going to plug this color into the input and I'm going to plug the output color into the subsurface color. So now here, instead of being white, it's picking that up. And what I'm going to do is I'm probably just going to up the exposure a little bit. So I'll maybe do this 0.1 you'll see that's going to get slightly brighter, not by much. And I'm going to up the saturation by 1.2. And now it's a lot more orange. So I'm just going to save this frame. So obviously this effect is way too strong and it's blowing out still inside, but rather than it being white now, we're actually getting color coming through. But um, we need to adjust some of these other options. So we've got this option called scale. And if we have a look at the Arnold documentation, you can see that the difference that a 0.5 scale makes, for example, versus a 0.25. One is by default, but because the object, this is a tiny little goldfish that's only a few centimeters long. So I'm going to assume that one is like one meter and I'm going to turn it down. So let's just say that it's like 0 0.2 as if it's a couple of centimeters long. And let's see the effect that gives. So I'm going to save this render and then render this region again and see the difference. So we can see straight away that that's completely changed it and it's looking a lot more realistic. And one thing about subsurface is it requires a lot more samples to work with. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to open my render settings and I'm going to change the sampling. I'm going to up the AA and I'm also going to up the SSS just to three, a little bit higher. So it's got more samples to work with because it's got all that light bouncing around, then you can get a lot more noise in it. So I find when I'm doing renders with SSS, I'm often upping the sampling really high, which often means that renders take a lot longer, but it is worth it in the final thing. So let's just quickly render that again. It's probably going to take a few more minutes now to do that, but let's go. So that's taken three times as long to render, but let's have a look at the result. So it really is quite subtle because I've changed the scale dramatically down. But what we're seeing is where there were shadows before, like in this nostril and around the lip, we're getting a lot more light bleed like you would in skin and stuff like that. And it just helps it look a lot less plasticky or flat. Um, and even in these kind of scales. This is why I mentioned earlier that things like normal map and displacement can look a lot softer by the time you add SSS because it really just softens out those shadows, which helps it or can help it look a lot more organic. So I know this value kind of works for me because it's the one I used in my final render. I think I actually might have used slightly less. So I'm just going to turn that down a bit. And the reason I don't use too much is because SSS can make stuff look very fake very quickly. If we take a look here, nobody's nose ever glows quite that much. It's way too strong. So it's worth mentioning that while SSS is a great thing to add, adding too much can completely kill a render, but then also not having enough. Like this face here looks very CG because there's no SSS whatsoever. And so the final option that we haven't yet adjusted is this radius one. Basically the way to think about this, it's kind of similar to the weight, is the, the higher the value or the lighter the color here, the more it's going to scatter through the object. So here you can see through this example, this is one, this is 0.5 and this is zero. And there's no scattering there whatsoever. 0.5 is half of one. So it's kind of like a multiplier that you can use. By adding color into this, by using a slightly red tint, you get a lot more red 
going through the SSS because those red light waves are traveling deeper than the green and the blue. So because the tint on these goldfish, we want it to be a little bit more red. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna turn this saturation down that we added into the subsurface color. So all I'm adding is a slightly lightened version of our base color. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of a tint into our radius. So I'm gonna select orange and I'm just gonna bring the saturation up. I'm gonna do something like that. So by putting this color in here, basically it means that our red and our kind of orange light wavelengths or whatever are gonna travel deeper into the object than the other ones. And it just means that our shadow is gonna be tinted in areas like this or where the SSS is showing, it's gonna be tinted slightly. So we don't necessarily need to get that from our color correction anymore. So we can see that taking that saturation down has really helped get rid of this. This looks almost like it had gangrene, like it had jaundice, sorry. And we've got a much more natural effect. But if I just remove this one and we can compare the base versus the normal. So it's very, very subtle, this SSS effect that we've got, but our shadows are, there's a lot more warmth in there. And if we have a look at our fin as well, we've got some subsurface scattering going on here because if you remember that mask, the map that we're using for the weight, we're still getting some SSS here. And so we're getting some backlight from that HDRI is kind of bleeding through in this section as well. And you can kind of see, not only is the base color coming out a bit more, but this radius is clearly being kind of added into it as well. So we've kind of gone through everything that you sort of need to know for setting up an Arnold shader, whether that's plugging in a displacement, a normal map, or plugging in one of your black and white textures into a mask, adding some color corrections, maybe clamping some of your textures down a little bit and setting those renders up inside of the render view. We haven't touched lights and we haven't touched really getting your render out. This video has really overran. I wanted it to be 15 minutes, <laughs> ideally to begin with, but I've got a feeling I've got like two hours of footage here. So I think it's gonna be a lot longer than that. So maybe I'm gonna have to split that off into a part two for the lights. You might have also noticed my throat has gone a lot more hoarse since talking for this long. So I'm gonna edit this, get it online. Um, if you have any questions from this, then I'll probably hold off doing the second part until this is up. So please leave them below and I'll try and address them in the second part. Yeah, look, Devin Arnold can be a bit scary when you first tackle it, but if you have good textures and you know how to plug them in, that's really half of the battle, if not more. Obviously, changing values and stuff like that can be quite difficult and can take a lot longer than I've taken here purely because I've already set this up once and I know what values kind of work for me. But by using the Arnold documentation, which is plentiful, there's information on every single one of these values, then you can really get up to speed. But it is knowing a lot of the tips and the tricks about how to set up your UDIMs, how to make sure your color space is right, how to make sure your object is opaque, all that jazz. Those are the little things that can kind of trip you. Uh, cool, that's part one of setting up shaders, I guess, in Arnold setting up your Mari shaders or whatever this video is gonna be called, I don't know. Take it easy, have a good one. Been Michael Wild, best of luck doing whatever you're doing in 3D EVFX. Stay safe out there. Cheers.